This is your PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Casey Kraft, Minjung Cho, and Ara Salabian. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the January 2020 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. This is the first Journal Club with the new 2020 resident ambassadors. I'm Casey Kraft, PRS resident ambassador from Ohio State. I'm joined by my co-ambassadors, Ara Salibian from the NYU Plastic Surgery Program and Min Jiang Cho from the UT Southwestern Plastic Surgery Program. I want to thank the 2019 resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Saniak for their phenomenal job over the past year. Today we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Alex Wong for our discussion. Dr. Wong is an Associate Professor of Surgery at the Keck School of Medicine at USC, Director of Basic, Translational, and Clinical Research, as well as the Director of the Microsurgery Fellowship in Medical Student Education in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So thank you to Dr. Wong for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thank you, Casey, for having me. The article we will be discussing is Matched Comparison of Microsurgical Anastomoses Performed with Loop Magnification Versus Operating Microscope in Traumatic Lower Extremity Reconstruction by Dr. Stranix at the University of Virginia, along with his colleagues from NYU and the University of Pennsylvania. As a quick reminder, this article, along with all the articles that are discussed in this podcast, can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all the past Journal Club articles. So the University of Pennsylvania is well known for using loop magnification for free flap reconstruction as opposed to the operating microscope. Countrywide, however, using the operating microscope tends to be the favored method for performing the anastomoses. Although many have published on the safety of loop magnification microsurgery, this is primarily focused on microsurgical breast reconstruction. What the author set out to do with this study was analyze a matched cohort of lower extremity free flap reconstruction using loops versus the operating microscope and to compare surgical outcomes. They hypothesized that lower extremity reconstruction is more challenging and thus a better proving ground, their words, for loop magnification versus the microscope. So briefly, the authors retrospectively reviewed a matched cohort of patients undergoing free flap below knee reconstruction at the University of Pennsylvania and NYU from the last 14 to 20 years. Patients were matched according to age, wound location, time from injury, muscle versus fasciocutaneous free flap, and the presence of arterial injury. They then assessed surgical outcomes such as take backs, partial, or total flap failure. The authors were able to analyze 373 patients in this cohort, with 150 being done under loop magnification and 223 with the operating microscope. All loop-only flaps were performed at the University of Pennsylvania, and the majority of microscope anastomoses were performed at NYU. They noted that the majority of loop-only flaps were fasciocutaneous versus muscle flaps primarily for those using the operating microscope. And the authors found no statistically significant differences in takebacks, which was 14.0 versus 16.1%, partial flap failures at 7.3 versus 8.1%, or total flap losses at 6.0 versus 4.9% between the two groups. Personally, I thought this, this was a great paper, albeit with a few important caveats to understand regarding the populations. I think it's really important to demonstrate that loops-only free flaps are just as successful as those done with the operating microscope in areas other than just breast reconstruction. Although the operating microscope is much more common, there are significant advantages that come with loop-only microscope, as the paper discusses. Demonstrating the safety and efficacy of loops-only microsurgeries and challenging lower extremity microsurgery further argues that it could be used more often. I think the important aspect of this paper, in my mind, was that the surgeon's comfort level with loops-only microsurgery, which the paper does briefly touch on in the discussion. The University of Pennsylvania is known for loops-only microsurgery, so the surgeons there are quite comfortable with that technique. At NYU, no free flaps were performed using only loops, which contributed to the bias between the two groups that were studied. So this study shows, that, in my mind, that microsurgeons skilled at loops-only microsurgery are equivalent to those using the microscope, but there's still likely a learning curve to loops-only microsurgery that is not seen in this study. For me, this highlights that loops-only microsurgery can be done in almost all situations, but one should either be trained in or have significant practice with loops-only microsurgery for it to be effective. So with that, I'd like to get Dr. Wong your thoughts on this study and if you have any personal experience with performing loops-only microsurgery. I personally don't do loops-only microsurgery, and that's not because I don't think it is effective or safe, and also not because I'm not enthusiastic about it. I do prefer a higher power visualization, but that's really just a personal bias, and I'd be willing to learn it and add it to my arsenal. Given some of the data here, it's compelling to consider it and add new skills as you evolve as a surgeon. 
In terms of the study, I think that the match comparison design was good. And the main thing I take away uh, is similar to what you alluded to in that, although I think commonly we think that loops only microsurgery is quote unquote recommended for microvessels that are larger, such as the ones you might see in the chest wall, like the internal mammary system for breast reconstruction, this adds a slightly different angle on it and focuses on lower extremity vessels, which sometimes can have more irregular recipient vessels. And, and I think that is the additive portion to it. I can get into some of the things that I thought were done well, and I think the matching is great. I really am enthusiastic about multi-institutional studies. I think it tends to, as long as things are matched well, uh, remove a lot of biases that adds a lot of power and impact to the study. At our institution, we have a few attendings that will do loops only in microsurgery, but the overwhelming majority prefer the microscope. I'm not sure if any of them were actually trained to do light loop only microsurgery versus just picked it up as they practiced, but it definitely is a strong personal preference I think that each attending has, although I don't think anyone would recommend or you know advise against using it if someone else had a different preference. Another thing I wanted to discuss with you is what your preferred flaps were for lower extremity reconstruction because the authors also noted that there was a big difference between institutions with what type of flap was performed with the majority of loops only flaps so being performed at the University of Pennsylvania being fascia cutaneous versus generally muscle flaps used at uh, NYU. I didn't know if you had a preference for muscle versus fascia cutaneous flaps when you do lower extremity reconstruction. I think both fascia cutaneous and muscle flaps have a role in lower extremity reconstruction and it does depend a little bit on what the defect is and what the other confounding issues are, whether there is going to need radiation or really sort of where on the leg is it. In general, as you get closer to the distal third and the ankle, a thinner flap is advantageous for wearing shoes and things like that. That being said, fasciculaneous flaps, which are thicker, can be revised and also muscles can be revised. Getting back to your question, I don't have a particular go-to for lower extremity reconstructions. The predominant flap is the anterior lateral thigh flap, and sometimes that requires a revision and debulking. I know that some institutions and surgeons will thin out the ALT primarily. My preference is, depending on the patient's BMI, I will advise them that if they are on the higher end of the BMI spectrum and we are planning to use an ALT flap, to really expect a unesthetic, large, bulky flap initially and once that heals, I prefer to do secondary revisions, which include liposuction, removing of skin, and also direct lipectomy, and I've been very happy with that. In other instances, I find that I like to use the gracilis, and also in instances where we're planning to do an ALT and the perforators aren't satisfactory, I will use a portion of the vastus lateralis as well. I also like a partial latissimus or full latissimus, depending on what's indicated. So I wouldn't say that I have a preference for one or the other, it depends on the patient's donor site preoperative condition as well as the expected defect. Yeah, that's pretty similar to what we have at our institution as well. I would say that the anterolateral thigh flap would be far and away the most common that we perform. None of the surgeons at Ohio State really will thin it at the primary operation, and we will do the same thing. We'll advise the patients that it's going to be bulky for a while, and then once everything heals and settles down, we can revise it at a later date. But I completely agree that there is a tendency to use certain flaps, but it always depends on the defect in the patient and the specific situation that you're in with each reconstruction. One thing that I thought was important and missing from this paper was that the authors were unable to look at the operative times or cost measures between the two techniques, which I think would be important and would have added a nice additional layer to this paper. I wanted to know what your thought would be on that and then whether you thought there was anything else that was missing from this paper that you would have liked to have seen. I certainly commend the authors for setting up the study and asking the questions. I think it's a good one. But you point out the operative time uh, and the cost are limitations, and I think the authors also point that out themselves. I think probably operative time would be the most useful index to examine. And the other things I thought that could be a future study would be something like a crossover design. So the bias is that, in general, the, the surgeons at the University of Pennsylvania were the loops users, and the NYU users were the microscope users. I don't know if it's possible, but if you could train both groups to be comfortable with both, 
then I think it could be more powerful and prove the point further if you had basically the Penn group switch over to using the microscope and then the NYU group switching over to using loops or just mix it up so that you might really pin down whether or not there's a real difference. The other thing I thought about was to consider a sort of laboratory-based or ex vivo assay and come up with maybe a very fine digital way to measure surgeon precision, whether it's using high-powered loops or microscope. And you can imagine some sort of dartboard where you ask you know, both groups of surgeons, the ones that tend to use microscope and the ones that use loops, and then literally have a target for them. Uh, you know, typically it's the vessel when it's in a patient setting, but you could set up a target and see how accurate people really are and find out if that's statistically significant. You know, it would be a lab-based assay, but I think it'd be interesting and you could do it in a controlled fashion. And that could be probably another paper. I don't necessarily think it should have been a part of this one. Absolutely, yeah, those are all great ideas that I think would be great leaping points to study in the future from this study um, that would help clarify a lot of things that weren't able to be looked at with this initial paper. I'd also like to ask my co-ambassadors, Ara and Minjiang, how often they see loop-only microsurgery at their own institutions and whether or not they have any personal experience with it or a preference between the two. At our institution, one of our attending is trained at UPenn for his fellowship and we do loop micros only in cases when we have a multi-flap reconstruction. So we don't use it for sender deep or sender profound artery periphery flaps, but we do use it when we have a four flap, which is a deep and a pad flaps together. And that is the case whenever deep and pad, whichever flap is ready, then the loop micro will be done on one breast while the other rib is being dissected for the recipient preparation. And also we do it for lumbar artery perforator flap. For those, we do the bilateral lumbar artery perforator flap. The flaps are harvested. And then the back micro is done on the vessel grafts. And then after that, we turn the patient to supine. And then the loop micro will be done for one lumbar artery perforator flap while the back micro is being done for the second lumbar artery perforator flap. Besides those two cases, we don't really use loop micro. We strictly use microscope for both private and then uh, county hospitals. I think at NYU, our experience is pretty reflective of what's in this paper. Dr. Stranix, JT, did a lot of great work with some of the lower extremity reconstruction here and took this over the pen. I think this was a great paper to come uh, away from it. Just about all our attendings will only use the microscope and we have tried using loops before. I've done it in a couple cases and some of the things I really do like that uh, actually Min Jong was hinting at as well is the ability to work with a lot more people in a close space if you have multiple things going on, being able to adjust your viewing angle and the depth of your field. The cases that we've done it in uh, were all for breast reconstruction so if they're really heavy ventilations and the chest wall is moving up and down it's much easier to adjust. That being said, I think even though it's a great thing, what we like more is just the higher power mag on the microscope, as Dr. Wong had mentioned. But I think it's also a comfort thing, and that was another good point that Casey and both Dr. Wong brought up, was that the microsurgeons at the University of Pennsylvania are obviously going to be experts at doing loop micro. So that does introduce bias in this and some sort of crossover study or even just a more diverse study that has other surgeons that maybe do both more often, I think would kind of lend itself to help out with that issue of the study. But overall, it was, I think, a great study and a good effort uh, between the two institutions. Absolutely. Thank you uh, both for your thoughts on that. Uh, and I would totally agree that at our institution, we have a few attendings that will do loop micro every once in a while, actually particularly with lower extremity reconstruction with what everybody else has mentioned, that in general, you can get more people operating in a smaller space just to move things along more quickly. But most of our attendings do prefer the microscope primarily for the higher magnification, just their own comfort levels with it versus doing the microsurgery with loops. So with that, I think we'll end our discussion of this article. Be sure to tune in for the other two articles that we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as the PRS Journal Club podcast that are broadcast every month. Don't forget to also participate in our monthly PRS Journal Club on Facebook, where you are able to interact directly with this month's selected article's authors. Finally, thank you again to Dr. Wong for joining us for this podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Be sure to read all of the articles being discussed, including some of the classic pairings from the archives, for free on prsjournal.com.